Was there a medieval version of the LSAT? Hey, I'll tell you my score if you tell me yours. Were law students taught via the Socratic method? What subjects did they take? Who could attend and who could teach? Did they have moot court and trial ad? How difficult was it to make law review? These and other questions will be answered right after this. Hi, I'm Professor Drew Markenberg, and I have been teaching a wide variety of history courses across this country for the past 30 years. In this video, I'm going to tell you all about medieval law schools, what it took to get into a medieval law school, who were the medieval law students and their teachers, what classes medieval law students took, and how law students were taught. At the end, I'll have the wrap-up quote on this video. But first, make sure to click like, share, and subscribe on that little bell thingy so I can continue to bring you more great videos just like this one. In medieval Europe, the law school predated the first universities. As the idea of a place to concentrate intellectual activity began with the discovery of a copy of Justinian's Digest of Roman Law in Bologna around the year 1050. And efforts to understand the Roman law found therein by scholars from across Europe led to a legal structure which today we call a university. In this study of first Roman law and then canon, that's C-A-N-O-N, or church law. Since all the texts were in Latin, one needed to know Latin. And from thence it flowed that all teaching was in Latin only, and given that the entire scholarly effort was to first understand these texts and any accompanying commentary or gloss on them, each course became simply a reading and commentary on one important text or book by a learned expert on that text. And here we see Professor Boring Students even way back then. By the way, you can learn more about this in my video on the medieval university. Which meant, as books were incredibly expensive, and again, learn more about that on my video about medieval books and manuscripts. Anyway, these learned experts or professors simply read the text out loud and an authoritative commentary on it, while the students carefully listened, trying to memorize it without asking questions, which method was called a lectio, which is Latin for lecture, and was repeated several times a week with students attending as often as needed, but no more than twice a day, until they had the text fully memorized. And here are students to see at a lectio right here. Notice the professor has a book, but none of the students do. On Fridays, the professor would then engage the students in a disputatio or disputation. And you see it occurring here. Uh, and by the way, you see all these little, uh, their hands and stuff out. Those are various mnemonic devices so they remember all the points. Anyway. The professor would pose questions on that week's readings to two students to argue the point, with the winner, as determined only by the professor, then disputing with the next student, and so on, until every student had disputed. This method forced students to understand all viewpoints, be able to refute them or support them, and hence to completely understand the material. Now in this, you did not need to know the material word for word. You just needed to know the gist of the material, all the different arguments and the knowledge. 
This was the teaching method used in universities across Europe and in postgraduate schools in medicine, philosophy, theology, and civil law. In civil law, in this context, meaning Roman and canon law schools, so Roman or in church law students. Here's, of course, a professor engaging students in a disputatio. However, in England, and again, you see yet another dis teacher uh, disputing and the students. In England, a very different way of teaching law had emerged in the 12th and 13th centuries, mostly due to England's precocious political centralization and legal development, such that by the time that Roman law had been adapted to medieval conditions on the continent in the 13th century, England's common law was already entrenched with many vested interests and quite heavily, quite advancedly developed. So England never became a Roman or civil law country, though Scotland did. At first, Scotland followed the same practice, the common law, as that of England, but Scotland needed ways to avoid complete English domination, and hence the Scots adopted a Roman and civil law regime. As a result, teaching English common law developed differently than that on the continent, where all legal schools, not to mention undergraduate, graduate, and medical education was controlled by the church. But instead, in England, it was controlled by the clerks and the men of law who practiced in the king's courts. It became more about practice, thus, than theory. And again, you see a teacher here uh, reading, and the students, in this case, they actually have a writing, a book, and of course, they're all as perplexed as many students are today. At first, the elements of the common law and the requisite procedures for starting lawsuits in the king's chancery were taught in rooms rented by chancery clerks themselves, in the inns of Holborn, which was midway between bustling London and their jobs at the Chancery in Westminster. So here we have a nice map, and all these places are still there to this day. So here is, let's see, this is, oh yeah, 14, that is, uh, yeah, this is right here, this is Temple Bar, here's Chancery Lane, that's Fleet Street. Here's the Thames River. Today's embankment, which back then what didn't exist. So Lincoln's Inn was here by Lincoln's Fields. Gray's Inn all the way up here. And then the old temple that was uh, belonging to the Templars was bought up. The inner temple becomes one law school. The middle temple becomes another. There was no outer temple that ever became anything. And then the rest of these places are the very inch different chancery uh, ends of court. By the mid-14th century, these clerks had combined their finances to purchase several of these inns, which then became both their home and office, where they continued teaching the rudiments of legal procedure for money on the side. The first was Clifford's Inn, established in 1344. We see here a remnant of it. There are very, very, very few pictures uh, from the Middle Ages of either the medieval inns of court or the medieval inns of chancery. Uh, so often what we rely upon are later pictures, usually from the 19th century. This is Barnard's Inn in 1883. This Clifford's Inn was followed by Thavies Inn, Barnard's Inn, Chester's Inn, Clement's Inn, Furnival's Inn, Lyon's Inn, The New Inn, Six Clerks Inn, Scropes Inn, St. George's Inn, Simmons Inn, The Staple Inn, and Strand Inn. 
And here is the, uh, the Staple Inn in 1880, along with a kind of a plan of its, what it looks like. By the end of the 14th century, the chancery clerks were primarily teaching students who hoped to practice law in the king's courts and not just work in the chancery. And the method adopted was the one adopted in undergraduate and graduate education, the disputatio, but also practical observation in the courts themselves. Now, at the end of term, capable students could then transfer to one of the four inns of court, which also exist, for advanced study, essentially as apprentices. And by the end of the 15th century, about 100 students were enrolled in one of these inns for study at any one time. Yes, these numbers are quite small, as was the entire legal profession. This is Lincoln's Inn in 1875, along with a nice map of all the buildings that it belongs to. It's quite large. And here it is, of course, Lincoln's Inn Hall. This was the main hall and dining room. This will also later serve as a court, main hall. And here's the old hall and the Inner Inner Temple. Now, just like chancery clerks, men of law we'll just call them today lawyers, needed lodging during the 100 days of the four court terms. Yes, the king's courts were only open for business on 100 days of the year. So they wanted to be near their clients in London, but they also needed to be near the courts in Westminster. And so they too stayed in the inns common to Holborn. And by the 14th century, they formed fraternal associations. By the mid-14th century, some of these legal fraternal associations began offering legal education in the inns they had purchased, notably Lincoln's Inn, Gray's Inn, and the Middle and Inner Temples. Now, there is a fifth one, which we'll get to shortly, which no longer exists, but it's a very special one. Here, of course, is a picture of the Middle and Inner Temples. By the 1420s, these inns were wholly owned by the legal fraternities and were chartered from the crown. <clears throat> by the 1420s, as I said, these inns were wholly owned by the legal fraternities and were chartered from the crown as the inns of court which exists to the present day as England's law schools, but primarily for what we today call barristers. So, trial lawyers. Eventually, each of these inns evolved into a complex covering several acres, with their own great hall for dining and events. And here you see, of course, the middle, this is Middle Temple Hall, as it looked back in oh, about 1880s. It isn't that different today, except it has more electric lights and stuff. Anyway, their own great hall, a chapel, gardens for strolling or thinking, a library and chambers or rooms for hundreds of lawyers. This is the Temple Church, which uh, served both the Middle and Inner Temple and uh, used to belong, was a temple church that belonged to the Templars, and so many of the Templars are actually buried here. So, oh, here is the old hall and in the inner temple in 1870. So, how did this legal education proceed? Okay, after graduating from one of the inns of chancery, now, presumably, before you went into an inn of chancery, you had gone to a song in a grammar school. But anyway, after graduating from one of the inns of chancery, law students would then be admitted to one of the four inns of court as an inner barrister, where they would spend some seven years. 
what would they do during this period? Well, one thing, they would attend the king's courts to note and watch the proceedings. They would discuss these proceedings with their fellow inner barristers, in other words, their fellow law students, and their teachers, the teachers who were known as the utter barristers and benchers. And this was based on written records, which were later published as the yearbooks, which are frustrating because when you look at the yearbooks, any one of the cases, they don't tell you in the end what happened. What is the final conclusion? Because they weren't really intended as a record of the entire case. They were intended as a way for the inner barristers to learn the law. Now, besides this, they would also attend formal readings of the statutes, the legal statutes by benchers, and they would perform oral pleading exercises called moots. So, in some ways, other than their practicality, the moot is kind of like a larger disputatio, and the formal reading of the statutes by the benchers is much like, um, kind of like an undergraduate education at the time, where the professor would just read and make commentary on it while everyone just listened. Here is the Great Hall in the Middle Temple. Anyway, after completing their training, students would hopefully be called to the bar, the bar of the court, as an utter barrister who at moots in the inns would stand outside the bar of the court, quote unquote, not a real court, but a court, which made them full members of the inn and of the legal profession, essentially a kind of legal journeyman. So kind of like the guild system. If you want to know more about the guild system, see my video on the guild system. Twice a year, in each of the inns, an utter barrister who had been in practice for at least 10 years would, if highly regarded by his peers, be elected to give a course of lectures on a selected statute, usually the really important ones. Many of these have survived. And this then would allow him, the one who has been elected to give them, to sit on the bench at Moots, on the bench for the judges, which would make him a bencher, which meant he could take part in the governance of his inn, much like a guild master in a guild. Now, besides the four inns of court, there was another fifth inn, highly specialized, known as Sergeant's Inn on Chancery Lane where 40, the 40, sergeants at law. Sergeants at law were a specialty class of lawyers. They had a monopoly of practice in the court of common pleas. And again, if you want to know more about the different legal court system in medieval England, see my video on that. Anyway, in the court of common pleas and case priority over other attorneys in the court of king's bench. More or less, the Court of Common Pleas is civil cases, and the Court of King's Bench is more or less criminal cases, though that's only a generalization. Also, by the 14th century, only the sergeants at law could be appointed as judges in the king's courts. So at the sergeant's inn is where they would work and live. Unfortunately, there are no pictures of Sergeant's Inn in the Middle Ages. This is the earliest one we have, Sergeant's Inn, as it looked about 1810. When the court system was reorganized in the 1870s, the Sergeant's Inn, the monopoly of practice, the Court of Common Pleas, uh, were, were abolished. The monopoly for the Sergeant's was abolished. And hence, they decided to simply sell off Sergeant's Inn. It was then demolished, and it's no longer around. There was also a sixth inn, 
which was not, however, connected with the common law. This was Doctor's Commons, whose members practiced in the church and admiralty courts, both of which were fields based on Roman and canon law. And later, both the Court of Admiralty and the Court of Prerogatives would meet here. There are courts who, Court of King's Bench and uh, occasionally the Common Pleas, would also meet in the Great Hall at Lincoln's Inn. Anyway, the picture seen here is the Admiralty Court in session at Doctor's Commons. Like the other inns, Doctor's Commons, seen here, the entrance seen from St. Paul's Court Cathedral, the courtyard, it had a great hall for dining and events, a library, gardens for strolling and thinking, but no chapel. Why? Because it was located inside the city of London, across from St. Paul's Cathedral, which is where the church courts were held. And here we are, the old hall in the inner temple, as it looked in 1826. The wrap-up quote. But besides all this, there is in and about this city a whole university, as it were, of students, practicers or pleaders, and judges of the laws of this realm, not living off common stipends as in other universities, but from their own private practice. In the inns of court, they study for the space of seven years or so. Frequent readings, meetings, moots, and other learned exercises, whereby growing ripe in the knowledge of the laws and approved to be honest, they are called to the degree of utter barristers and to practice the law, both in their chambers and at the bars of the king's courts. John Stowe. Let me know what you think of this quote in the comments section below. Also, what you liked about this video and what other historical topics or subjects you'd like to see in future videos. Be sure to click like, share, subscribe, as it will help me bring you more great videos on the Middle Ages. And click on that little bell thingy so you'll know when the next History Waits for No One video is posted. If you want to know more, there are recommended studies on this topic in the description below, along with other ways to connect with me. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the past.